Wise Ways Research. I do want to point you to the first page in your packet on the back side. There's a list of, that are called success markers. And this is another one of those pages that I would probably have in my back pocket as you think and work with your district leadership team as well as your school leadership teams. These are called Indistar success markers. Some of them are in fact indicators of effective practice, so indicators that are on, in your list of 88 for schools and 35 for districts. But more than that, these are six, what successful schools who use Indistar do. And it talks about the school leadership team meets on a regular basis. That's obviously one of the indicators that successful teams meet twice a month for at least an hour. It talks about the school leadership teams regularly review information on their Instar site. They dialogue with coaches. When we get into the coaching piece, I want you to remember, when you're providing support and coaching comments or feedback to your schools, you should tell your schools, let them know that you expect them to respond. There's nothing worse than providing feedback and feedback and feedback and getting no feedback from them, right? So make sure that you have that as an expectation for your schools that when you're providing coaching co support and comments, that you want them to dialogue back with you. And don't apologize for that expectation. When you ask a question, you do expect a response, right? I mean, is there, how many people have teenage or adult kids that, you know, never pick up their cell phone? I can remember telling my son in college, I'm going to turn that cell phone off. I pay for it. If you don't answer my calls, right? I mean, really, or, or they just, you know, even I send them texts and they never respond. Like, what's the deal? I, I just think that it, that's just not the way I raised him. And I, I think just there's a courtesy there. When you ask a question, somebody should respond. It's also a gauge for understanding, so that you know they're understanding what type of feedback and support that you're giving to them. Inside of the success marker, we talk about principal's role, providing direction for the teams, the teachers, implementing effective practices. These are success markers. I would share this with your teachers, your leaders, and make sure they share it with all of the staff, that this is what we're going to do to make this process successful. So these are just practices that they should be doing on a regular basis. For the district, it talks about the same things. The district leadership team making decisions, meeting on a regular basis. But also one of the indicators at the district level is that they're reporting up. They're letting folks know, maybe at the school board of the state, what we're doing to support our schools. Utilize those reports that are in the system, and that's part of the slick kind of thing. Um, there's some great reports in there that you can share with people to show how your districts and schools are progressing. And you should be proud of the things that you're doing and the, proud of the things you're implementing. That's success. You, if you can make your schools and districts even just a tiny bit better, that's part of your legacy, right? Many leadership teams, all teams that meet, are, are pretty used to having norms posted. I'll take this one step up. These aren't just success markers. These are success norms. This is what's normal for successful teams. So I would post them. Keep them posted in that room along with those questions. And when people stray off from these success norms, you need to get back on track and remind yourself that, yeah, this is what we do. Okay, so we're going to give you an overview of the continuous improvement cycle. And I forgot to mention that after lunch there's a quiz, a test of sorts. Uh, it's a fun test. But we will be talking about, um, we're going to do a collaboration activity. We're communicating with one another, working in teams to show how much you learned today. We're really talking about the continuous improvement process, leadership teams meeting. Um, using the research, using the resources, so that will be an activity after lunch to really help gauge how much you learn and, and how you can work as teams to kind of communicate that. So when we talk about continuous improvement, you'll notice there's one word that's on here several times. What is that? What was it? 
leadership teams. Because leadership teams are crucial. I'm going to say it over and over and over. We have had principals try to do this process, like the old annual process, where they say, Susan, could you go in and fill this out for me? Mr. Harvey would like it sent in by Friday. <laughs> and it won't work. I promise you that if someone thinks that they can fill this out as a single person or ask the secretary to fill it out, you're not going to see progress. You have to work as a team. You have to have conversations. <coughs> You have to read the wise ways and figure out what does success look like? How can we get there? Make a plan for success. Set target dates and goals. That's how this process will work. So we're going to reiterate the term leadership teams engaging over and over and over. It's pretty easy to spot uh, the absence of a team. If you drop into a plan and you see a lot of I did, I will, I plan on, well, one person's writing a plan then. We have to have the concept of we. The only way you can build investment in the wider community is through the team. And we kind of are leaving behind that thought of buy-in. To me, buy-in sort of implies that it's a one-shot deal. I'm gonna give you some money and you're gonna give me something back. I'm buying it, right? Investment sort of implies that you're in for the long haul, right? When you invest your money, what do, you know? Even the market is volatile; it's up and down. All the experts tell us just just leave it there, okay? Let it ride. Let just leave it there. You're in it for the long haul. So continuous improvement planning is a marathon; it's not a sprint. And you want people to invest in it and know that the leadership team isn't that group of six to eight. The core decision makers are not the people who do all the work. You're going to farm the work out side of the team to the people who are best suited to do the work. I often say, I don't want to be on this team if I got to meet twice a month and you want me to do all the work now. The team is going to oversee the work, but you're going to farm the work out to the people who are best suited. The example I gave with the, with the three windows at the Chicago Public High School, CPS High School, they're shot out. Are you going to ask the sophomore department chair to fix the windows because she sits on the team? No. You're going to invite the custodian into the open chair, and you're going to sign that work to the custodian. You're going to oversee that the work gets done if you're a team member, but you're not going to be doing all the work. You're going to try to build investment outside of the team. And yesterday we had um, one district, it's either yesterday or Monday, um, one district said they had, you know, they have 25 new teachers this year, and I said, how many <coughs> teachers do you have total? And there was about 90, 90 staff members. And I said, if your core leadership team is six to eight people, think of how many other people you have to help you with the work. That's what you want to utilize is your school community. All of your teachers, you could use students, librarians, custodians, maintenance. All of those people are there to help you implement the school improvement process. So figure out who might be suited best for that job and share or distribute the work. That's how you can improve in this process and get better. It's not just six or eight people doing the work. Um, it's the whole school community. So this is just an overview of the, uh, the continuous improvement process. The leadership team begins by assessing where they are currently on some of the indicators. Um, there are 88 indicators. The state has designated some of those indicators for schools and districts. Again, there's 35 at the district. They have designated some of those indicators as key. I like to call those key indicators very structural. A couple of them are about leadership teams meeting on a regular basis. Again, if you're not doing that, you're not going to progress forward. So every district and every school should be successfully implementing those indicators. Additionally to that, um, you have, all have a needs assessment, <coughs> schools have needs assessment, and there are some indicators or areas that you need to work on. Go find the indicators that will help you improve in those areas. Um, I would say a general rule, a, a district or a school could comfortably work on six to eight indicators at one time. You're not doing all of the work at one time. You might assess and create a plan for one indicator now. 
And then at the next meeting, while those things are in place, you're gonna plan for another indicator. So because this is a continuous improvement cycle, you're not gonna do all of that work today and try to figure out how to implement all of it by next Friday, right? So you can comfortably do that. There are specific schools and specific districts that might need to slow down a bit. There may be, they're not quite there, and they need to you know, back it up a little bit. But make sure to use those needs assessments to help guide you what you need to do. And then those 88 indicators, if there's something else that schools want to work on or districts want to work on, those are choice. Go get one. Whatever you feel that you need as a priority <coughs> for the district, that's what the indicators are there for you to do. There's no wrong ones. They're all research-based. They're all effective practices. They're all things that highly effective districts and schools do. So there's not a bad choice in there. I would say the only bad choice would be if you pocket yourself into one area. Like, hey, let's not worry about leadership teams or leadership or instruction. Let's just solely focus on family engagement. You might back yourself into a corner there. We really need to make sure that we're distributing the areas that we're trying to progress on. So after leadership teams figure out where they're at, so they're having a conversation, they figure out where they're at, they need to create a plan for success. They have to figure out what success looks like and create a plan. This is what we want it to look like in our school and this is how we're going to get there. You create a plan, you monitor the implementation of that plan. You're making sure that things are getting done. You're checking them off. You've created the tasks, which are the things that will get you there. It's about monitoring, are those things getting done? Are they getting accomplished? And then sustaining, making sure that you're not getting it done just for this year or for this month, or because, you know, while the principal is, is here. You're getting it done and you're creating a sustainable <coughs> plan so that next year you have steps in place to orient, orientate the new teachers, to give information to the new building principal that this is how we do it so we don't have to start over. Does that make sense? So we're going to talk Sustainability about that. Is, is, is just critically important. I always tell everybody, I have literally lost the same 20 pounds 100 times in my life. And they keep finding me, or they kept finding me, because I never had a plan to sustain the progress that I made. Once I figured out the sustaining part, I've been like, great. I've been great for a number of years now. But I'm telling you, the sustainability thing, we learned this through the, Depart the Department of Ed, learned this with SIG 1003G monies. Those are the competitive monies, the competitive side of Title I that we give out just the chronically underperforming, the lowest 5% of schools in the nation. And typically there are high schools because the gap kept growing, right? So they were, always would fall in the lowest 5%. And we started out giving those grants as three-year grants, if you're familiar with them, right? And in CPS, most of our schools in Illinois fell in CPS, and we were pouring in to the tune of $9 million over three years into these high schools. And guess what we learned? After we took the money away, after three years, because we didn't help them develop a sustainability plan, all of their, all of their progress, what, they went back to square one again. After $9 million. I mean, that, that was a, a bitter pill for us to swallow at the state board. So then Ed sort of wised up and said, we're not going to make these three-year grants. We knew it took longer to turn a battleship around than three years, right? So we made them five-year grants. And at least we gave everybody a pre-planning pre year, pre-implementation, three years of implementation, and a fifth year of sustainability. And we weren't throwing $9 million at everybody either. I mean, so we did learn our lesson, but again, if you don't have a plan for sustainability, uh, it, 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 you just are on a really, 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 lack of a better term, slippery slope. You're going to slide right back down. And I would say one of the things that we learned with SIG as well, um, a lot of the schools went in and purchased human capital, right? They went in and got coaches, um, support personnel. And what happened after a few years, they started using these coaches to do things. You know, bake the coffees and plan this and plan that. 
but they were never building capacity in the schools. So what happened was, for a lot of those early SIG schools, after three years, the dollars ended, and they never built sustainability. The money was gone, their coaches were gone, they hadn't learned anything, they hadn't built up systems and processes to be successful. Um, and so a lot of those first round of six schools across the nation were not building sustainability for those reasons. And so the reason they kind of moved to the five years because they had to think about, you need to plan for what happens when the money's gone. <coughs> so for sustainability purposes and continuous improvement, we need to build enough capacity and sustainability so that if that wonderful, great turnaround principal, who is admired by everyone, leaves our building, how can we continue to be successful when we get a new principal? When half of our staff leaves or retires, and they were wonderful and great and they did all of these successful processes, how do we continue to move forward with the new staff that we get? It's because you're building a sustainable process. Um, we have an Instar video that we did a, several years back, and there was a, um, a young woman from Glen Oak um, in Illinois. And in the video, she's so passionate about the work that her team is doing. And she says in the video, this is no longer what we did at Glen Oak. This is what we do at Glen Oak. And it always hits me that that's where you have to get. You have to make this about a change kind of in lifestyle. This is a change in process for our school. It's not what we're doing this year. It's not what we're doing for next year. This is how we do it now. People who are really successful with weight management don't talk about diets. They just eat differently. They eat clean. Okay, it's a, it is a lifestyle change. You've got to help the people you're supporting routinize and ritualize the process. Indostar may come, I don't, who knows where Indostar will be, you know, 50 years from now. It's the process that you want to routinize and ritualize. And if you are successful in doing that, this is my experience, it can become the organizational stabilizer in that setting. In other words, and I don't know about here in Arkansas, but in Illinois, we have a lot of principals and superintendents who, who come and go. In fact, CPS that lost 83 principals. Chicago Public Schools lost 83 principals for the start of this school year. So if you know anything about CPS, they're in a terrible budget crisis. I mean, they're almost bankrupt. <coughs> so I think some people thought, I better get the heck out of here and find some other greener pasture, right? And they did. Can you imagine as a large district trying now to replace 83 instructional leaders? 83! That is like huge. But, if you have the process, the continuous improvement process, routinized and ritualized, shouldn't matter who comes and goes. Because some of the team will remain, and they're just going to say, this is how we do business. This is what we do. This isn't what we did or what we're going to do. This is how we roll here in this setting. Okay, before we get into specifics about assessing, creating, monitoring, and sustaining, we're going to take a look at some of the resources besides the wise waste research that we have to provide support for schools and districts. Um, the wise waste, of course, are research groups that provide context for the indicators. Sometimes they give examples. There's built-in guiding questions. We know that sometimes um, leadership at the building level or even at the district level have hard times kind of engaging people at the very beginning. Maybe they don't feel comfortable. And so we're trying to build their capacity in that respect. But we give you guiding <laughs> questions to help you kind of engage conversation when it, maybe there's a little bit of a stalemate going on and we're not quite sure. Um, so if you're working with those building <coughs> leadership teams, utilize those guiding questions to kind of spark conversation. Um, the district also has some guiding questions in your indicators. So if you're the superintendent or anybody, in, for that matter, if you're having a conversation and you kind of have, you're stalling out a little bit, use those guiding questions to continue to engage the conversations. Uh, we'll look at each of these specifically in just a minute. Indicators Now is a resource, and 
Um, indicators now, indicators in action in the modules can all be found on indostar.org. I believe there are links also on the ADE website, okay? So the indicators now, I really, really enjoy this. These are just video clips. So we actually started with indicators in action a few years ago. These are tutorials, free professional development, you heard me, free. Um, they were created with federal dollars, so they're forever free. So they are professional development pieces. They are well underutilized. I was actually caught myself watching one of them the other day. I was looking for something and it was like an hour later I was still watching it. So they're pretty engaging. Um, indicators in action are pre-recorded. They include an explanation and information about the indicators of effect, effective practice. They also include videos of real teachers, real leaders, real superintendents, um, classrooms, hallways, schools that show highly effective practices and they explain how they do it and why they do it. The indicators now are simply the videos. So if you don't want to go to, through the whole professional development suite and you're having a conversation with your leadership team and you've read the wise ways and you're maybe not all still on the same page, pull up the video and watch a video and see what it looks like actually in action. So those videos are really great. And then of course we have the training modules we talked about earlier. Um, Again, I don't like to call them training modules, but more process modules. There are, I think, about nine of those. There is one specifically about navigating the platform. We only decided to make one because the plat platform is not, I mean, it is a tool. It's there to keep you on track. But more than anything, you really need to go through the processes. So we really want to divide the processes up and make those professional development opportunities for you. The wise ways, this is what a wise ways might look like in the system, and hopefully many of you have seen them, and I know you can't read that, but I'm just trying to give you the image there. But each wise ways has a context for each indicator. A lot of times we're not all on the same page. So we're looking at an indicator, I think it means one thing, Maureen thinks it means another, Mr. Harris over there, he doesn't know what it means. Right? So the wise ways, your leadership team, this is how a leadership team might work. The process manager, maybe the principal or the team decides what are we going to talk about at our next meeting? Which indicators are we going to look at? The process manager would create an agenda. The leadership team members would look at the agenda to see which indicators we're going to work on at next Friday's meeting. And they're going to take <clears throat> the time to pre-read the wise ways. So when we come together as a team and we only have an hour or an hour and 15 minutes, we can really engage in a conversation. We're all on the same playing field. We all know what the research says. We're looking at the same document and we can have a conversation about where are we at and where are we not. <clears throat> the wise ways has a research synthesis. Again, it's not the end all be all. You can watch a video, you can go dig down and find some more information if you would like, but it's enough to get the conversation started. It has sometimes action principles, sometimes it'll have examples of what other schools have done, and it'll say Tulsa, Oklahoma Elementary does this, and it'll give an example of something that a highly effective school might have done. It might have checklists. It might have a bulleted list. Um, and then there's always references, resources, and guiding questions, so if you want to know more. So that's what the Wise Ways will do. There's one for each and every indicator. <clears throat> the Wise Ways are in the system, and this is just what a Wise Ways link would look like when your teams are in there in the system. And you can just pull it up. Um, for leadership team members, they can see it here too. I actually thought I took that slide out. But. Indicators now, those are the videos. This is what the indicators now map looks like. The great thing about indicators now and indicators in action, which again are the videos and then the, tutor the professional development tutorials, those are all based on ADI's indicators of effective practice. 
The great news for Arkansas is you're using those same indicators. So all of these resources align to the indicators that you have. So if you want to go watch a video, you can be assured that there's a video out there for, for those indicators. And you can see they're structured very similar to the indicators, the core functions and effective practices that your schools have built in and your districts. So again, if you're in a coaching role, capacity building role, you can keep that tool in your toolkit, or if you need to build the capacity of a superintendent or principal, share those tools with them. Let them be the rock stars and use them with their staff. Um, indicators in action, again, is a free professional development piece. It can use, be used individually, so if you would like to go use some of it individually. It can be used in workshops. We've seen districts take their leadership, building leadership, and get them together and do a workshop uh, there's three courses. The three courses are instruction, leadership, and school community. They're really easy to use. You can print out the facilitator's guide. Again, if you can push a button, facilitate a conversation or activity, you're gold. And I'm sure everybody in here can do that, right? So each of those courses, you can see this is a breakdown of instruction. There's different modules, instructional planning, classroom management, instructional delivery. Each of those sections has a worksheet and a facilitator's guide with activities, and you have to hit play. That's all you have to do. And again, this is free. We know how much sometimes dollars count. You don't have dollars to have some of the, you know, to bring somebody in. If this is something that you could utilize, and I would encourage you to go in and check it out and play around with it. You're not, it won't you know, make you log in or anything like that. You can just start anywhere you want. Uh, this is what actually indicators in action looks like inside. So we talk about the effective practices. Again, they're aligned to your indicators, so that's pretty great. Well, what, can you go back to that slide, Stephanie? What's also nice, oh, we're on this side. You can see that there are, are 14 segments in this particular indicator in action. So you can chunk it, you know, chunk and chew, chunk and chew. This could actually take a principal through 14, um, you know, weekly staff meetings. And then, of course, we have the training modules. Again, these are on the Instar website. And if anybody um, went into the Instar website last month and came back in this month, you'll notice it's a little bit different. Um, we are still fixing a few glitches. Uh, but the training modules are at the bottom in the middle. There's three circles, and I believe it's the middle circle. So the training modules are to assist users in teaming, leadership teaming, engaging in a culture of candor, and achieving a success mindset. They're really engaging you about the processes. So we've thrown around that term culture of candor a bit this morning. Culture of candor is this. You leave the blame game at the door, you come to the table, and you're not making excuses, but you are looking for explanations. So no excuses, looking for explanations, leave the blame at the door. Um, each of the modules, just to clarify, they are pre-recorded again. You hit the play button, facilitate a conversation, you're great. Some of them have built-in activities. They may have built-in worksheets or documents. Just print those out and work through those with your teams, okay? 